This is hands down the most critically panned album I have ever seen in my life. Teddy Perry's worst album by far. It's so monotonous, the lyrics are cringe, and the productions are just ugh. It feels like on this album, Katie and her team just have lost the pop plot or just uh, voluntarily buried their heads in the sand. And I am resenting 143 because every part of it sucks. So over the last several months here on this channel, I've sort of become a Katy Perry historian. I've covered everything from the controversial rollout of Women's World as a single to the subsequent music video to some of the ways that Katy has tried to save face in the public eye after being met with backlash for her controversial decision to return to working with music producer Dr. Luke. The tale of Miss Perry's comeback has been meandering and wandering and at many times rather unpredictable. And so now that the album is out, I thought it would be fun today to put the whole story together and take a look at how exactly we got here. Because behind every mega flop is of course the context. And I think the year that Katy Perry has had so far can teach us a lot about artist image, authenticity, and what happens when a simple pop bop is not enough to take you to where you want to be. We're like, we're not about the male gaze, but we really are about the male gaze. <laughs> and we're really overplaying it and on the nose because I'm about to get smashed which is like a reset, a reset for me and a reset for my idea of feminine divine. Part one, this should not have been this hard. I've said this before, but nobody has been more primed for a comeback in 2024 than Katy Perry. And I say that because if you look around, the Sabrinas and the chapels of the world are making upbeat, campy fun pop music with a sexy edge. Something I think we got away from a little bit in the eras of Lord and Billie Eilish, two artists that I definitely love and appreciate. But to some extent, I think society is craving the stupid camp nonsense bangers that Katy Perry was known for in the 2010s. And I think Katy Perry herself was at the very least somewhat also aware of that because for this upcoming new era, she decided to reunite with some old collaborators who made her her success on the album Teenage Dream, an album that is widely regarded as one of the best pop records in the last few decades. And this would have worked in theory had that list of collaborators not included Dr. Luke, a controversial music producer who is known mostly for a drawn out legal battle with Kesha who claims that Dr. Luke assaulted her. This case once again has been settled out of court. Despite Dr. Luke's controversies, he still manages to get his hands in a lot of your favorite pop singers' tracks and records in the modern day, most notably Doja Cat and Kim Petras, but the difference with Katy Perry was that in a previous album era, Katy Perry did make the choice not to work with him. Ahead of the release for Katy Perry's first single for this rollout, it was initially rumored that Dr. Luke was credited on this new Katy Perry track, however people were trying to dispute this and say that it was a fake leak, although it was later confirmed when the song did come out, and from there Katy had an objectively uphill battle in trying to get people on board with this new era because she seemingly elected to work with an alleged abuser on a song about women empowerment, no less. Not only that, but the music video left little to be desired as well as the song because it was an unfortunate mix of old school bro objectification and 2016 millennial era feminism. So needless to say, after Woman's World, Katy Perry had a lot of ground to cover in anticipation for her full album release, 143, which came out on September 20th. Okay, so now that we are all caught up on the Dr. Luke controversy and the Women's World single rollout, let's get to the next phase of this, which was the media press tour. Katy Perry talks a lot. The um, first picture I put out in my bikini with my robo legs, yes. I call that character Alpha Phi. Oh. Alpha female. Oh, um, I see. And I don't know. I just make up these narratives in my head. Um, And it's just like I feel super grounded and ready to run faster than ever. And like I love playing with future textures. And I feel like I feel connected to my feminine divine and all parts of my feminine. And so, yes, I feel very sexy. A lot of people have expressed disappointment and were really upset that you decided to involve Dr. Luke on this album. Why did you choose to work with him? Look, I, I understand that it started a lot of conversations and he was one of many collaborators that I collaborated with. But the reality is it comes from me. The truth is I wrote these songs from my experience of my whole life going through this metamorphosis. 
And he was one of the people to help facilitate all that. One of the writers, one of the producers. And I am speaking from my own experience. Like when I speak from, when I speak about woman's world, I speak about feeling so empowered now as a mother, as a woman, giving birth, creating life, creating another set of organs, a brain, a heart. I created a whole ass heart and I did it and I'm still doing it. Now, Katy Perry has always been like kind of quirky and out there in her interviews. It feels like anytime anyone puts a camera and a microphone in front of her, she's bound to just kind of say something that's a little nuts. And what I've gathered from all of these moments on Katy Perry's press tour for this album, Call Her Daddy and Otherwise, is that she's definitely one of those like Hollywood yuppie free spirit love people. She's constantly talking about meditation and her feminine energy. And like, I'm not, I'm not trying to judge you if you have any kind of spiritual practice or you like meditation. I'm just saying that if you use that kind of language to deflect from a question about why you elected to work with a controversial music producer on your album, it's just a little unserious. And it feels like out of that whole press tour of Katy Perry going on all of these interviews and podcasts and radio shows, that was the most coherent response we got about her decision to work with Dr. Luke. Something that even her most diehard fans are disappointed with and want answers on. And let me just briefly address that this week there was like a fake post going around in which somebody claimed that Katy Perry said that she was contractually obligated to work with him. I don't think it's real. Somebody I think just made that up. But I think in addition to the failure to address the Dr. Luke situation appropriately on Katy's part, a lot of these interviews showed to me that what Katy wanted this album to be and what the outward marketing package for it ended up being were kind of two different things. In a lot of these interviews, she talks about how this album was inspired by her relationship with her daughter and her experience with motherhood and her relationships. It seems like she wanted this project to come off very grounded and intimate and personal, which is kind of the opposite of what we know Katy Perry for mostly. But then all of the branding for this era was like very cold and futuristic and almost AI inspired. A lot of people accused her of sort of like doing this cringe pandering to the LGBTQ community, which sucks because I do think that Katy Perry can be a little bit charming when you allow her to be. For example, sort of the last kind of major event that capped off this album rollout before the album actually was released was her performance at the VMAs. She performed a medley of her songs and had the opportunity to speak to the crowd because she was the recipient of the Michael Jackson Video Vanguard Award. I'm using images here because I don't think Paramount will let me use any of this uh, for copyright reasons, but she was great. I think her performance was really good. And I think for some people, it is unfortunate how the Dr. Luke stuff seemingly tainted a lot of what this new era could have been. When she spoke to the crowd, she also talked a little bit about how you know difficult it is to kind of make it and have a long-term career in the music industry as a woman, which, you know, obviously I'm not going to dispute that. And then talked about how the most important thing for your mental health is to log off and touch grass, something that I would know nothing about. This is just a random aside that's not really important to the narrative here, but also this night a lot of people were pissed off because I guess the VMAs decided to do a fan vote poll for like the most iconic VMAs performance ever. And the answer to that uh, is obviously Lady Gaga doing paparazzi. Like it's one of the most iconic performances of all time, come on now. And Katy Perry won for Roar, which I'm assuming is because she was there to get the Vanguard Award and like Lady Gaga wasn't there. But yeah, people were so heated over this. I don't think this was Katy Perry's fault. I think it was just a logistics thing, but damn. So the Katy Perry press tour had concluded. There was still an air of controversy in the atmosphere because of her decision to work with Dr. Luke and because she had sort of a lackluster response to that backlash. By and large, she was incredibly down for the count. But the thing about the internet is that it is incredibly fickle. And many people are often willing to look past certain controversies as long as they are being supplied with quality content, whether it's a great movie or a decent TV show or some stellar box on an album. And it was up to Katy Perry and her 11 song track list to turn this ship around. And... All right, so really briefly, I want to recap my live 143 listening experience. I listened to the album at work just because I wanted to see, you know, what the final product was after all these months of coverage. Uh, after I listened to the album, I took my headphones off and I noticed some irritation in my left ear and I was like, hmm, what's that about? Um, I kind of just stuck my finger in there and then I realized that my left ear was dripping blood and I was like, that's weird, hate that. So after work, I went to urgent care and the doctor looked in my ear and she was like, oh, that's weird. You have like a really long, thin scratch in your ear canal. 
uh, that just kind of suddenly burst open and now it's bleeding. So she like flushed it out with hydrogen peroxide or whatever it is that doctors use. And then um, I had to take antibiotics in my ear for five days and here's my prescription. So you know that I am not lying. Um, and I'm not saying that this is Katy Perry's fault. Uh, I don't even think the album was bad enough to make my ear bleed, but um, I'm just saying that is a thing that happened. Okay, so yes, medical problems aside, I did manage to listen to all 33 minutes of this album and it's fine. I don't think it's the worst thing I've ever heard in the world. The one song I kind of like on it is the one that she did with Dochi at the VMAs. I think that one's all right. The rest of it is pretty forgettable for me. It's very short. It's nothing like Teenage Dream, which is the most baffling part to me because if she really wanted to include Dr. Luke in this new era, that reads to me like she was trying to sort of read the moment and find some sense of her old style in her new work, but each track is entirely too generic for that premise and it all kind of blends together. As far as the reviews, you've probably seen that this album has like record-breaking low reviews on Metacritic and stuff, which honestly I don't put that much stock in because like Katy Perry has never been a critical darling. That's kind of never been her role in the music industry. Teenage Dream is beloved now, but I think at the time like it was still kind of being panned by critics because dumb, stupid, sexy pop music was like the worst thing that a woman could be doing around the time that it came out. So like, I, I truly never expected this to be a critical darling, but at the very least, I was interested to see whether or not it would ultimately like win positively in the court of public opinion. And it seems like the answer to that is no. And I can't help but wonder if the hate train that is running on this album right now would be that bad if it weren't for the whole Dr. Luke controversy. Like as soon as people heard that Dr. Luke was involved in this project, they were rooting for the project to flop. And so flop it became. I I wonder if the reception to this album, which, you know, appears to be very generic and uninspired would have been more forgiving had people chosen to not revel in the downfall just because a problematic person was associated with it and therefore that made it okay to take part in the bashing. Like in another world where Dr. Luke didn't collaborate on this album, would I have been yelled at on twitter.com for disliking it because I'm a no good hater who despises fun. And obviously we are an entire universe away from that kind of outcome, but I do I do think ultimately that this was the most consequential choice of Katy Perry's career. And that is the full story of Katy Perry's 143. We've laughed, we've cried, we've watched in awe at how bad an album rollout could possibly get. And this is my last video on Katy Perry for the year. Now if you'll excuse me, I have to go take some eardrops. Thanks so much for watching you guys. Uh, I know things look a little different around me right now and that is because we've rearranged my apartment a little bit. Uh, so we're testing out different formats and what have you. Uh, so I guess let me know if you like it or if you don't, I'm open to hearing all opinions. A uh, reminder that you can follow me, all the social media listed in this beautiful link tree, which can be found in the description down below. Uh, have a great day. Let me know what your favorite album of this year has been so far. Mine is Billie Eilish's Hit Me Hard and Soft. Thanks so much.